Next, we will have panel discussion one, implications of the Russo-Ukrainian war for the Indo-Pacific. First of all, uh, let me introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, from uh, the right-hand most side, we have a Professor Matsuda Yasuhiro uh, from the University of Tokyo. Uh, from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, uh, the Dean of uh, the SAIS and also former Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Mr. James Steinberg, Senior Advisor and Japan Chair of CSIS, former Director for East Asia on the National Security Council, uh, Mr. Christopher Johnston, and as a moderator, we have... Uh, a Dean of School of International and Public Policy from Hitotsubashi University, Mr. Akiyama. Now I would like to hand over to Professor Akiyama, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. My name is Akiyama. We have uh, uh, such a stellar uh, panel members, and I am very happy to moderate this session with uh, such a distinguished panelists. The title of this session is the uh, implications of the Russo-Ukrainian war for the Indo-Pacific. Now, Russo-Ukrainian uh, war has uh, quite a few characteristics in my view. One of them is uh, the nuclear uh, weapon is attacking non-nuclear neighboring country using uh, nuclear weapons possible use as a, a threat. And the role of nuclear weapons is being highlighted in this war. Now, uh, the between Russia and the U.S., or the maybe Russia and NATO between great nations. The relationship between great nations has been deterred uh, by the uh, nuclear weapons. However, this is uh, causing a paradox whether this region is subjected to stability or instability. So against this backdrop to allies and partners, uh, extended deterrence credibility is one issue and also nuclear weapon country uh, is providing security assurance to non-nuclear states and the credibility is being doubted in this sense. Another point is multi-domain main uh, nature is actually uh, exposed by this role. 19th century type uh, balance of power like a military clash. Of course, that is one feature of this war. However, uh, we have come to understand, in addition to that, there is an information uh, war, a false flag a war, and also intelligence is playing a very important role on the battlefield. And also in terms of economy, economic sanctions play a role, and also supply chain is being affected through the war. So through this war, all these issues has been uh, highlighted. Regarding regional uh, order from the Indo-Pacific perspective, by Russia, the aggression by Russia, many countries are opposing, of course, Russian aggression. However, that itself is a, a problem in terms of international law. However, in reality, uh, this role presents what kind of advantage or disadvantages to all countries. This is one perspective. And we can say that India is taking a quite ambiguous uh, stance to this war. Russia is not actually a rogue state. Uh, that is not the simple equation that we can apply to international politics and international order. We have to have a broadened perspective and we have to consider future international order, particularly Indo-Pacific, how it is going to develop in the future, and also great country uh, China. China may invade Taiwan, to some extent, this threat has uh, some degree of uh, credibility. So balance of power type uh, approach is still dominant or rule-based international order. Is it really effective? Could we offer rule-based international order going forward? That has to be considered as well. So uh, against this backdrop, in this panel, since the time is limited, we would like to focus on three questions. One is, 
in East Asia or Indo-Pacific for this region, this uh, Russo-Ukrainian war, what was the most important lesson uh, that we learned? So this is a more general and comprehensive uh, question. Second point, uh, China, how China views this war and uh, what lessons did China learn from this war? Third question, in this situation, what needs to be done by Japan and the U.S.? Maybe the situation may deteriorate and the Indo-Pacific strategic environment may deteriorate in the future. How should we respond between Japan and the United States? First question, that is the uh, lesson for Indo-Pacific. What was the most important lesson learned? For this question, I want to ask uh, Professor Steinberg to lead off. Uh, Professor Steinberg, please. Okay, much better. Um, so thank you, and, and let me begin by thanking the, uh, our friends from Nikkei for the opportunity to continue to be part of this. I haven't been to quite as many as John Henry, but it's been my privilege over the years to be part of this extremely important session. And so thanks to you and to, to John and the folks for CSIS for allowing me to be part of this, and especially pleased to be back in person here in Tokyo after too long a period of time away. Um, the question we're discussing today is an extraordinarily important one, and uh, I think it is true, as the moderator has suggested, that this is uh, an event which has sent shockwaves around the world, and I think it's, it's hard to underestimate the, the profound consequences of the Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine. So I want to suggest that there are at least six lessons that we have learned as a result of this, some of which I think were previewed in the moderator's response, but really shaped the, the broader discussion about the long-term implications. The first and most dramatic, of course, is that aggression in a kind of direct military land-based attack is possible. And I think uh, for many people, uh, we had come to believe that the nature of the international system and the ties between countries had made this kind of old-fashioned war not possible, and there were constraints on the, the ability or the willingness of states to conduct this kind of operation. And uh, President Putin has obviously put the lie to that. The use of force of this type of, of sending land forces across borders is clearly still possible even in the second, third of the 21st century. The second lesson we've learned is that force is not decisive that the, the notion that the Russians could simply roll over uh, and achieve a quick victory uh, was not possible, and just that the use of force by itself does not guarantee that, uh, that you will have a quick or decisive victory. And in parallel to that, the third lesson is that defense matters, that it is possible to respond, even to uh, an attack by what was perceived to be a superior force, that it is possible with the right tactics, the right equipment, and especially the right motivation for the defense to be successful. And the old adage about the ability or the advantages of defense uh, has proven to be uh, quite visible uh, in the case of Ukraine. The fourth lesson is that the United States and its partners in Europe and in Japan and in other countries are not feckless. That in the, in, in the face of this aggression by Russia, that the, the countries who have, com have committed themselves to upholding the rule of law, of international law, and resisting the idea that aggression should simply be tolerated, have come together in a very impressive way, very quickly, very powerfully, with a strong degree of consensus, acting in ways that imposed very significant short-term costs to all of our countries uh, to take significant um, action. Um, there's no question that, uh, as we've discussed and as John previewed and the moderator previewed, there has also been some degree of risk aversion. But if you look at this in a, in a glass half full, glass half empty way, I think there's reason to feel good and reassured about the level of, of, of both cohesion and intensity in terms of what I will call the Western response. Related to that, fifth lesson, that sanctions work sort of. That is, on the one hand, we have seen the willingness of countries to impose very, very significant economic penalties on Russia at some significant cost to their own economies. But we've also seen that, as we've seen in so many cases in uh, not even recent history, but over many years, that there's a limit to the efficacy of sanctions. And the international economic system is very complex 
And that as we've seen, for example, in the, in the connection with cutting off uh, exports of Russian energy, uh, that Russia has not only found a way around that, in its ability to sell, sell to countries that haven't uh, join the, the sanctions, but also because of the impact on the international oil market, revenues, at least in the short term, to Russia uh, have increased. Nonetheless, I do believe that the sanctions are imposing a significant and long-term cost on the Russian economy that is not trivial. And the sixth lesson is the one that our moderator began with, which is that nuclear weapons do matter. That they, the, the fact that Russia has nuclear weapons and that there is some credible fear that, might, that Russia might be tempted to use them under some sort of circumstances, has had a powerful effect on shaping the response of the United States and uh, our partners. So these obviously have enormous implications for the Asia Pacific, because it makes us realize that the kinds of challenges and fears that many people have been concerned about are not uh, simply fear mongering, but rather uh, fears that need to be taken very seriously, that things are possible that are hard to contemplate, that seem irrational on some level or not in country self-interest. But nonetheless, we have to prepare for the fact that, uh, that there are countries that are willing to take risks, that may perceive circumstances where they feel the necessity to take risks in ways that we find hard to uh, take on board, but nonetheless require us to take seriously in our planning and to apply these lessons uh, from the Ukraine conflict to the situation in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much. That in a very compact or concise way, you mentioned a very important point. And uh, we have two more panelists, uh, Professor Matsuda and President jo uh, Mr. Johnston. If you would like to add something to the lessons learned for Indo-Pacific for the first question, if you have anything to add uh, briefly, can I have your comments? First, Professor Matsuda, please. Hi, uh, Thank you. Now, I was preparing for the next question, so I was uh, taken by a surprise, a surprise attack, if I may say so. I need to learn this lesson. Now, the world is so much connected, so how can we counter Russia and try to end the war and prepare the exit for her Russia? When we think uh, just about Europe, then uh, the Russia need to withdraw in some form, whether President Putin will be able uh, to uh, seek compromise so that he could give up. But from the point of view of deterring the next war, we should never ever allow Putin to be successful. So we need to thoroughly punish Russia this time. This is because we need to demonstrate to China in order to deter the next war, we need to have very strict cost to be imposed on Russia. But then when Russia is cornered, it could use nuclear weapons, which could lead to further tragedies. So this is quite a difficult decision to be taken. But... The nuclear option, the threshold is still very high. Up until yesterday, nuclear was not uh, used, but what about tomorrow? The world has changed dramatically. So basically, what we need to do is to thoroughly weaken Russia. This is what we need to do. And when and if nuclear weapon is used, then it uh, would uh, be engraved into uh, the human history forever. So we need to think about those consequences. So we should not look for half-cooked exit. This is uh, quite uh, uh, the precarious. We need to think about how to deter the next war. Yes. Thank you very much. The exit to the... Uh, war, there is a dilemma with regard to the exit, as was explained earlier. Perhaps Indo-Pacific region, in one way or another, if there is a clash or conflict in this region, we have to consider uh, that kind of exit uh, as well. Uh, if we have time later on, I want to go back to Professor Steinberg to make a comment on this point. But before that, I would like to invite Mr. Johnston to say 
make uh, just three quick points building on the really excellent points made by my, my co-panelists. Uh, first, building on this point about uh, the rational actors and the assumption that is often uh, uh, baked into uh, foreign policy leaders that, uh, that the world is based on interactions among rational actors. Uh, clearly, this war demonstrates that that is not uh, a, a reasonable assumption. I was inside government at the time. It was striking to me that as we began to share the intelligence picture with our allies and partners, uh, and the growing assessment inside the United States government that yes, Russia was likely to invade Ukraine, how much skepticism and doubt there was among our allies and partners about that picture, how much reluctance there was to accept the idea that there could in fact be a major war in Europe. So I think I do think this is a critical lesson that we must all absorb, and that is that we can't assume uh, that our adversaries uh, will act in ways that we consider uh, rational, uh, and that major war is possible, and the major war is possible in Asia. Um, second point I would make is it's also clear that um, once the use of force is begun, you set in motion things that you can't control and you can't foresee. Uh, so it's quite clear that Putin had a plan to seize Kyiv, uh, the capital of Ukraine, uh, in the opening days of the conflict. Uh, but when that didn't happen and his forces became bogged down, uh, there was no plan B. There was no uh, uh, backup uh, strategy. Uh, and there was a scrambling on the part of Russia to, to, to reorient uh, their approach and to, to, to recalibrate the war. Uh, so this, this critical lesson that, that you, once you use force, you set in motion uh, uh, events that you, that you can't control um, uh, and, and can't necessarily foresee. Uh, finally, I think a point worth making um, and a positive lesson from, uh, from a U.S. perspective, the use of intelligence and the public release of intelligence as a means of controlling the information space uh, uh, and controlling uh, the, uh, the information environment surrounding a conflict. So in my view, the Biden administration was very effective at releasing intelligence information uh, as, as it was detected, essentially, about the movement of Russian forces, what we knew about Russian intentions, uh, making that information publicly and publicly available and effectively putting President Putin on his back foot, uh, justifying, forcing him to justify his actions and explain his actions in ways that weren't credible. So I think this is a, this is a tool that will be of use uh, in the future. Uh, for, uh, for foreign policy leaders, the use of intelligence strategically in a public way uh, to shape the information environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, whether the actors are rational or not. And also, the other point was about the, the importance of intelligence. We often hear about battleground, but not just uncertainty of information on the battleground, but uh, uh, the uh, rationality and what may be the intent uh, of our adversary. We need uh, to always gather intelligence uh, beforehand. There are uh, states uh, in Asia who are quite opaque and intransparent. So we have uh, to learn a lot of lessons uh, from what is happening uh, in Ukraine. Now, on uh, the two remaining questions, I would like to ask the panelists to respond. And then at uh, the, uh, the end, I would like to have an overall discussion. Now, how is uh, China observing uh, this conflict? What kind of lessons have China may have learned? So can I start with Professor Matsuda on this? Yes, China is watching closely what is happening with the war. It has made a huge study and research on this. But because Xi Jinping has clearly stated its support of the Putin, the, the space in China is that they cannot be negative on the Russia. But if I may scrutinize on what is happening, there are negative lessons as well as positive lessons learned by China because of the conflict. The first negative lesson that China may have learned is that war does not uh, evolve as they have planned or desired. The Ukraine uh, was quite strong uh, in their resistance and Russia was weaker than how they have been thought. Uh, so decapitation, 
uh, the operation, uh, or the uh, false uh, flag operation. In uh, any case, those who would never be successful, and the war has prolonged, and Russia uh, is losing. So this was quite unexpected. The second lesson, which is the other side of the coin, U.S. and Europe and Japan uh, they have uh, come together very strongly and have uh, put forth a large-scale sanction. This was also quite unexpected for China. When Russia pushes hard, then Ukraine will fall. That is what China has thought, and NATO may fall, and U.S. and Europe relationship may be destroyed, and Putin may be quite successful. That is what the China may have envis envisaged. So unexpectedly, there has been very strong solidarity on the West, and the sanctions have been very large scale. Thirdly, Russia and Putin has, have become villains of the world history. Whenever Russia has taken over Crimea and have attacked uh, Georgia, they were not uh, thought to be villains. But this time around, they are definitely villains. Now, when a tipping point is being achieved, the things would uh, dramatically change. So Russia is now the stark villain of the world. China is watching very closely what is happening right now. So when you total all the lessons learned, war cannot evolve as you have planned. So what you need to do, if you are to go to war, you should not never prolong the war, but you should go on a very short period of time and decisively. And as a positive lesson, Taiwan and Ukraine are very different. This is an internal issue. It is not uh, uh, a aggression into sovereignty of a different country. So the United Nations can never come up with a resolution uh, to criticize. And uh, because this is a reintegration efforts, uh, the Chinese soldiers uh, would be highly motivated, which is very different from the Russian soldiers. I believe this is uh, something of a skewed logic as we see it, but I think their logic is uh, as such. And the Ukraine uh, is uh, connected uh, on land with Poland and, and other countries in Europe, but Taiwan is an island. So when it is uh, being closed out, then Taiwan, uh, if they shoot all the ammunition, then Taiwan has uh, had to crumble. So this is the second positive lesson. And third positive lesson is that China is very different from Russia. Chinese economy is 10 times as large as Russia. So uh, China uh, can uh, stay on her and uh, preserve itself. So uh, the China will be able to withstand any type of uh, the sanction. And now another lesson where no conclusion is being reached yet, but nuclear will work as a deterrence. If you have adequate deterrence over United States, China will be able to prevent intervention by United States. But the no conclusion has been reached yet because the war is not over yet. So this could be the fourth positive lesson is what I'm suggesting for China. So uh, China has to acquire capability to successfully in a very short period of time end the war and would have to have effective deterrence uh, power over United States. You need to have uh, the nuclear power um, as large as that. So. You need to take time to make that happen. So with negative lessons and positive lessons, the full invasion against Taiwan for China to acquire such capability and be able to deter the United States to have that capability would take quite a long time. What has been argued more recently is that Taiwan contingency could happen maybe next year. But that, I believe, is quite uh, limited uh, in possibility. There could be some provocative 
military exercises, but not full invasion. If full invasion, it takes a longer time to prepare. Now, the party convention is going, going for the Chinese Communist Party right now, but as I have been saying, Xi Jinping would never end his career in just three terms. Uh, that he had to have uh, taken away all his enemies. So maybe the third term and fourth term and fifth term, he would never give over his power until he dies. So it's not just five years, more than 10 years of tenure is what he need to ensure for himself meaning that it, he will take a long time uh, to expand the military capability so that uh, Xi Jinping will be waiting until China acquired enough capability to deter the United States and then will go for a full attack. I believe that, that should be uh, the uh, plan. So, on our side, we need to enhance our deterrence power and go ahead with the diplomatic process. Thank you very much. You talked about the difference between Taiwan and Ukraine. And viewed from China, there is a difference between Taiwan and Ukraine, the status of a sovereign nation. That is a difference. From, However, from our perspective, treaty ally or the uh, is it guaranteed by uh, domestic U.S. Uh, uh, law? Maybe there is a difference uh, between Ukraine and uh, Taiwan. So the uh, America's intervention, is it possible? America will be deterred from intervention. So that was uh, something we have to uh, wonder. Now, on this point, uh, viewed from China, what was the lessons viewed from China? How about Mr. Johnston? What would you like to say? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hesitate to offer uh, comments on China uh, in response to uh, uh, such an expert as, as Matsuda Sensei, uh, but I, I very much endorse um, the views that he expressed here today. It seems to me um, uh, quite clear that one of the lessons for China uh, from this conflict is the risks for Xi Jinping of launching a full-fledged invasion of, of, of Taiwan. Uh, that has to be a factor that has registered with the leadership in Beijing. It seems to me that one consequence is perhaps in the near term, it likely gives greater impetus to the development of strategies in the gray zone, below the threshold of, of, of full-fledged invasion, to put pressure on, on Taiwan and attempt to coerce the dynamic in the cross-strait uh, situation toward, um, uh, uh, toward, uh, toward unification. Uh, but I do think it, it makes the likelihood of full-fledged uh, invasion uh, certainly a higher-risk decision for the, for the leadership in Beijing. Maybe I can say a couple of words about North Korea as well. It seems to me that one of the, the, the implications of the conflict is unfortunately uh, probably reaffirms for Pyongyang uh, that possession of nuclear weapons is the best path to securing its own security. Uh, the statement in September that the North Korean regime issued affirming that their status as a nuclear weapon state is irreversible, setting out conditions under which North Korea would use nuclear weapons preemptively. Um, it, it seems to me that, that some of this is a direct result of, of the dynamic that they are seeing in Europe and their awareness that Russia's status as a nuclear power has influenced the way NATO has approached the conflict uh, in Europe. So it's therefore critical, I think, as, other, as others here have said, including Akiyama Sensei, that we think about steps to strengthen deterrence. Uh, in the region. Uh, US, stronger U.S. affirmations of, of, of extended deterrence, demonstrations of, uh, of our capabilities, strengthened U.S., Japan, South Korea cooperation uh, in the defense area. All of these things, I think, are particularly vital now uh, uh, in, in light of the behavior we're seeing from, from North Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much. With regard to North Korea, thank you very much for uh, making a point on that. Professor Steinberg, I would like to uh, ask you the same question. How about lessons for China? How did China view uh, this war and also uh, Taiwan, uh, the China's possibility of invasion into uh, Taiwan? How do you see such a possibility? So thank you. These have been terrific remarks. I, I guess I would begin with the observation that 
we often try to answer these questions as if, if we were sitting in Beijing, how would we respond and what lessons would we learn? Um, but I'm not sure that's necessarily the way it gets seen in Zhongnanghai. And I'm also pretty confident that we don't know what in fact the lessons are being learned by the Chinese leadership. And the problem here, and I think uh, Matsuda Sensei's comments illustrated, is that you can see this both ways. Because on the one hand, you can see, well, the Russian problems uh, should cause, you know, be a source of, of concern and pause in Beijing to think about the, the risks associated with an attack. On the other hand, you could also see uh, Beijing drawing the conclusion that what uh, the lesson they should learn is that if you're going to do it, be decisive. And don't use these gray zone tactics. Actually, that if you use gray zone tactics, uh, Taiwan might be able to resist even more effectively, and you need to just make sure that you have a decisive and quick victory. And because we can argue this either way, I think we have to be cautious about assuming that we understand the lessons uh, that have been learned there. But I, I would venture a couple that I think are, are possible possible or more, more likely than not in terms of uh, lessons that the Russian, uh, that the Chinese have learned. One, I think they have learned the lesson that they shouldn't rely on the Russians very much. I think that the, the experience, um, and we don't know to this day exactly what uh, President Putin told President Xi when they met on the eve of the Beijing Olympics, but this has not been good for China. I think that's indisputably the case, that, that being associated with the, the Russian action has been difficult and problematic for China for a number of reasons, and that we saw in the recent SCO meeting that despite the fact that uh, China would prefer to keep the focus on what's wrong with NATO and, and the provocations there, that uh, it seems pretty clear that President Xi has, has expressed in rather clear terms to President Putin about uh, his concerns about what's been done there. And the fact that he emphasized the need for uh, the end of the conflict there, I think, uh, is a pretty good indication of that. Uh, the second, I, I think, is that the, um, the, the Chinese have seen that um, countries will respond as their interests drive them uh, in response to these kinds of events. That despite the, the transparent violation of international law on every principle on earth known to the UN Charter, uh, that even countries which are nominally our partners uh, were slow to criticize and careful not to cut off their ties uh, to Russia. And, and it would be of concern to me that uh, a lesson that would be learned in, in Beijing is that um, despite uh, the rhetoric, that many countries will act as they see their economic and political interests. And so the, the danger of being seen as a scapegoat, a, a rogue, a, an isolated, uh, may not be as apparent uh, to the leadership uh, in, in Beijing. But I, I do think that, um, and again, I think that as we look at the situation and see um, the, the efficacy of the Ukrainian response, uh, I think it, it certainly will be something that can't have been missed in Beijing, but I think it's also something that doesn't necessarily uh, caution uh, action on their part. As to the possibility of conflict, again, precisely because we underestimated Putin's willingness to use force, when we talk about rationality, the rationality is rationality in a context. And so certainly I think the idea that uh, Xi Jinping has a lot of time is certainly true. On the other hand, if he concludes the time is not on his side, and if he's going to be there for five terms, and, and Taiwan has become, become both more successful in developing its defensive capabilities and more emboldened to move away, he may decide that acting sooner rather than later is the better choice, notwithstanding the risk. So uh, I long ago got out of the prediction business. I think we get ourselves into trouble, but I think we need to be mindful of the very serious possibility that the, the calculus, the rational calculus in Beijing is not the same that we would apply if we were sitting in Xi's position. Thank you very much. So our way of thinking of rationality and the Beijing's view of rationality are different. And also to what extent and when it happens, rather than considering uh, that, we should be fully prepared. I think that was the message. Now, lastly, then, uh, what Japan and the U.S. have to do in the face of such a situation? Earlier, Mr. Johnston, uh, gave us a preview a little bit on this issue. The uh, deterrence has to be strengthened, he said. More recently, national security strategy was released by the U.S. Integrated deterrence concept was uh, announced, and we wonder what that is. 
and、uh, we have been in debate on this、uh, matter. Now, in this region, the US and Japan, how could we prepare ourselves? So, on this point, I would like to ask Mr. Johnson to kick off. Very much.、Um, I, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the lessons from the war in Ukraine, specifically focused on, on the US and Japan. But I do want to hearken back first to the, the, the most important lesson that Jim Steinberg set out up front, which is unfortunately the reality that major war、uh, remains possible, as shocking as that is in 2022. And it's possible in East Asia, and we must do all that we can to, to prevent it. I think. Uh, the good news is that there are some things that we have learned, I would argue, from the conflict in Ukraine that, that may be of relevance as we think about how to strengthen、uh, deterrence in,、uh, in the Indo Pacific region.、Um, uh, and I will cite three、uh, briefly here.、Uh, the first is the, while the United States and Japan are very much at the core of building、uh, deterrence in the region, Uh, the importance and value of building a global coalition that is prepared to deter and respond to conflict、uh, is clearly underscored by the events in Ukraine.、Um, critical importance to signal to potential adversaries、uh, that the response to aggression will be broad and deep、uh, and that it will extend beyond、uh, the region in which the aggression takes place. And here, I think the role that Japan has played in the, in the Russia Ukraine conflict. Uh, is very important, and it's of great credit to, to Prime Minister Kishida, as Dr. Hamri noted in his opening remarks. Japan led Asia、uh, by joining the response、uh, to the invasion early and aggressively, imposing sweeping financial sanctions, export controls,、uh, adjustments to energy imports,、uh, direct support to Ukraine, including a package of security assistance that was unprecedented in the post war period.、Uh, And in making these contributions、uh, in the early phases of the response, Japan's actions served to make the response to the conflict global and, tr and transformed the conflict from one that was a European conflict to one that the, that the world as a whole was responding to. And Japan's actions served to bring other Asian partners into, into the effort as well. Soon after, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, other Asia partners also joined、uh, the sanctions effort. And I think it's fair to say that this was a surprise to President Putin. He did not expect that there would be such a comprehensive response globally、uh, to, to the aggression. I think he thought that he could localize the conflict. Uh, and divide Europe、uh, on, how, uh, on how to respond.、Uh, and that was not, of course, the case. So, this concept that the rules based international order is indivisible, it's not separated into regions, we're all connected,、uh, is a vital one. And it's, and it's one that, that Prime Minister Kishida understood from the outset when he said that uh, 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 conflict in Ukraine could be conflict in East Asia tomorrow. So, as we consider the risk of conflict in Asia, Um, the US and Japan should always be giving thought to how we can put in place that coalition that's ready to come together、uh, in response to aggression, whether it's from North Korea or from, uh, or from China.、Uh, and there are a number of ways to do so, many of which、uh, Dr. Henry and other speakers have alluded to today. Strengthening ties with other allies and partners in the region. The Quad's relevance here is very important. Strengthening ties among Uh, our other alliances in the region. So, the, the alliance with the, with the ROK, the alliance with Australia, even the alliance with the Philippines. And I think, in particular,、uh, engagement on the part of our Asian partners, Asian allies with NATO is very important. I thought Prime Minister Kishida's visit,、uh, participation in the NATO summit in,、uh, in June in Madrid was significant. Uh, serves to again bind these alliances,、uh, bring these alliances more closely together.、Uh, and that, along with、um, initiatives like AUKUS, the Australia US、uh, UK cooperation on defense capabilities, all of these things serve to build, to build that fabric Dr. Hamry mentioned uh, and to、um, uh, create that global coalition、uh, that signals how high the costs would be in the event of the use of force. So that's point number one. Second point, building on the first,、um, uh, and again, hearkening back to Jim Steinberg's points at the beginning, the importance of economic tools in deterrence in response.、Uh, I think one of the outcomes of the, the, the war in Ukraine has been sort of the revitalization, if you will, of the G7 forum, the importance of that forum as a, as a location where coordination on, on, on economic policy, economic sanctions in particular, has become uh, uh, truly central. 
So the threat of sanctions, of course, did not prevent Russia's invasion, and the imposition of sanctions hasn't stopped it. Uh, I think it's fair to say that President Putin probably didn't believe the warnings that he got very clearly from uh, American and European leaders, but they are imposing pain. Uh, and will have a long-term impact on the Russian economy. And other potential adversaries will watch this impact very closely and will watch the ability of the international coalition to sustain unity in, uh, in, 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 uh, in imposing those, uh, those sanctions. In the short term, of course, uh, the impact on the Russian economy has been somewhat masked by high oil prices, but it's clear in a number of ways that the sanctions are having real impact. Economic activity in Russia is declining. There's a clear difficulty in sustaining military stocks, particularly of, of high technology systems, uh, and Russian imports have plummeted in a variety of ways. Um, so, of course, as has been noted, uh, including by Masada Sensei, a similar, in the pro a similar approach in the Indo-Pacific, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, is much more challenging, much more complicated. Uh, given the size of the Chinese economy, given the degree of interdependence between us, given China's role uh, in a number of high technology sectors, uh, that is reality. Um, and so uh, a critical step for the United States, Japan, and other partners is to begin to find ways to reduce our dependence uh, in a targeted way uh, on the Chinese economy through steps like supply chain diversification, protection of critical technology, investment screening, these sorts of steps. Japan's economic security law, I think, is an excellent first step in that direction. The US is also taking steps through the CHIPS Act, through uh, measures announced earlier in October related to export controls on semiconductors. Uh, but putting the pieces in place for an effective economic response uh, and putting in place economic constraints on our potential adversaries, I think very important and a lesson that clearly emerges from uh, from, the, from the war in Ukraine. Finally, of course, is the urgency of strengthening the credibility of the US-Japan Defense Alliance itself. And here I think the news is quite good. I do think the news is quite good. Japan's consideration of a significant defense buildup, uh, its consideration of significant new capabilities, including uh, counter-strike capabilities, is welcome and has the potential to make a real contribution to deterrence in the region, in my view. Of course, the issue is not just the size of the budget. It's very much about how Japan chooses to spend these resources. We've learned a number of things militarily from Ukraine. For example, how much logistics matter, fuel supplies, ammunition supplies, resilient communication networks, readiness and maintenance of equipment, the ability of forces to move and disperse quickly. Uh, the ammunition issue in particular has been significant. It's been uh, revealing how quickly uh, ammunition stocks are uh, consumed in a, in a major conflict. Um, so it's particularly, I think, uh, welcome from my perspective that, that the, the defense planners at the Ministry of Defense understand that this is an important part of Japan's uh, coming buildup. Um, and there is a, a, a very strong focus on building this dimension of, of deterrence. The, the logistical capacity, the, the, the supplies of equipment, the, the, the maintenance and readiness of equipment, this is a focus of, uh, on the part of Japan and one that is welcome and I think uh, uh, is also one that the United States is working closely with Japan on. Um, uh, finally, I would just say that uh, um, it, the importance of, of deepening our, um, uh, the alliance cooperation with the other major US allies in, in the Indo-Pacific. So, so of course, South Korea, Australia, uh, deterrence in the region is not just a matter of the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, it's, uh, we need to send the message that, that, uh, that uh, other partners in the region could come together as well, send the signal that allies can't be divided. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and as well, a part of this is the U.S. Uh, affirmations of extended deterrence, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to North Korea. So the bad news is that major war remains possible in the 21st century, including in Asia. The good news is that I think we have learned some lessons on steps that we can take uh, to prevent it. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. For one thing, Japan's role. You mentioned, uh, thank you very much for giving us a very positive assessment with regard to roles uh, being played by Japan. Naturally, in order to respond to China, the dependence on China should be reduced. 
and that is a major challenge we are facing. And also, the uh, strengthening of the alliance, needless to say, and also defense budget, rather than the size of the budget, how are we going to use that? How are we going to improve the operation and in a sustained way? So the uh, how we can make the uh, investment uh, with a significant increase of defense budget. That was very important. Personally speaking, not only with like-minded countries, but also the countries which are taking rather ambiguous stance and how we're going to involve global south. I think that is uh, important to consider. And also, unlike NATO in Europe, in the case of Indo-Pacific, traditionally speaking, uh, heaven spoke type of alliance is in existence. In such a situation, how could we build deterrence architecture which is uh, effective? So this is the point I would like to ask you later on if time permits. The same question to Professor Matsuda. Hi, I do fully agree here to what Mr. Johnston has said. It was quite comprehensive in his remarks. But if may, I may add, in trying to build our deterrence, so there were many things being suggested. And thank you very much Shifter, for your kind words on Japan. But uh, we are still a very underdeveloped. Uh, the vulnerability of self-defense force is still very evident. When a war occurs, can our defense a regime the work or not? There is a strong sense of crisis within the Ministry of Defense as well as self-defense forces. We need to have that resilience capability, we need to have survivability and stockpile of ammunitions. We need to do all of this. And then on top of that, we need to have uh, the counter-strike counter capabilities as well. These are still missing elements and we need to, uh, to uh, do more significantly. We shouldn't wait until anyone else tells us there is one more point that I would like to add on diplomacy with China. Now, bringing solution to the Taiwan issue for China, this is not the only priority. Development and growth and stability are also top, top priority issues. So strengthening deterrence is very important. But on the other hand, we could suggest that stability matters. Economic growth and development is also important for you. This is the kind of approach we should always keep in place vis-a-vis -vis China. Four key technologies, perhaps we need to reduce our dependence on China. But as a neighbor to China, Japan, what we need to do is that we should prosper together. How that is important and stability is very important. We should continue to approach China from these perspectives and make overtures continuously. The third point is Xi Jinping. As long as he stays at the top position of China, the situation would not change that much. Uh, the Democracy, uh, as you can see here in the UK, uh, the leader changed all of a sudden. There are good things and bad things about democracy. So the leadership can ch be changed easily. Uh, you can blame all the bad things for the previous leader and uh, you can all, all of a sudden reset yourself. But China, she cannot reset so suddenly, so we cannot expect that much of a change to happen. But after Xi Jinping, China could change dramatically. If we think ahead for more than 10 years, uh, the younger generation and the elites and uh, the middle class uh, leaders and those uh, who are studying abroad, Chinese people are not our enemies. We should be friends and we should keep important ties with them. We should think in longer term. So strengthening deterrence is very necessary, but don't think that China is an enemy overall. No, we should not be that simplistic. There are many levels and many 
means and methodologies and many faces when we are、uh, to the work with China. Thank you very much. I was listening、uh, to your remarks. It's quite difficult in security and also in the socio economic、uh, sphere. Maybe we should take a double track approach to China. So, the,、um, how about Professor Steinberg? Well, thank you. And、um, I find myself in the happy position of violently agreeing with both of my colleagues. And, and I think it harkens back to John Henry's really wonderful opening address. When he praised Japan not only for the, the strengthening measures that Japan has taken, but also the balanced diplomacy that Japan has undertaken. And I think we could learn a lot from that as well, because I do think that we require both a, at this time. And, and, and it's essential to keep this in mind, because China is not the Soviet Union. It's possible that it will collapse and fade away as the Soviet Union did, but I don't think we should base our policy on that. And so this is a very、uh, powerful country that has a lot of assets and is going to be around for a long time. And so So, we still have an obligation, however much we are concerned about the very revisionist policies that、uh, China is pursuing both internationally at home, to recognize that this is something we're going to have to reckon with for a long time. And just as we learned、uh, in the middle phases of the Cold War, that direct confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union was, not, was too big a risk to take and something brought home to us in the Cuban Missile Crisis. We have to find a way、uh, to manage these two things, these two tracks that the moderator talked about at the same time. We just must do this. We cannot have a one dimensional policy. So I think there are a couple of things that we need to think about、uh, in that respect. I think first,、um, we need to、um, uh, recognize that、uh, John. Correctly、uh, raised concerns about the US economic policy in the region. And I think we can all be nostalgic about the TPP, but it isn't just the Democrats who aren't in favor of it. I don't think you can find anybody in Congress who's in favor of it. And so、uh, it's not a direction we can go, and I, I'm resigned to that. But, but, but we don't have to continue to shoot ourselves in the foot. And、um, it's one thing to say that we're not going to give new market access, but it's another thing to take actions as we've done in the CHIPS Act and the IRA to actually harm our friends and to actually make it harder for, for our friends in Japan and South Korea and others. Uh, to do business in the United States. If we're serious about this and we're serious about creating、uh, cooperation among like minded people, at some point we have to stand up for the principle that, okay, well, we're not going to.、Um, To dramatically increase the market access for ASEAN countries and others. But surely we don't want to reduce the access that we currently have or reduce the investment opportunities that we now have. So that, that's one thing that I, I think we need to do. Second, I think we need to be very careful about the strategy of reducing dependence on China. It's a two edged sword, right? I mean, we can do this,、um, but it will increasingly、uh, persuade China that we're not particularly interested in China's economic well being. And frankly, it will make it easier for China to take measures because they'll be less. Uh, susceptible to our economic measures. And we see this in efforts to、uh, turn the, the RMB into a reserve currency and create new payment mechanisms. We see this in a lot of other、uh, spheres. And so we certainly need to protect our critical technologies, and we certainly need to make sure that we have resilience. In our supply and diversity in our supply chains. But if we basically decided that we're going to have, we're going to do the extreme version of decoupling that some people advocate, this is going to just convince China all the more that it's a, it's a zero sum proposition that we're, we're operating in, and there'll be that fewer constraints. Uh, on taking action. Because at the end of the day, you know, we have to find a way to convince China that it has to abandon its more extreme revisionist objectives, whether it's in the South China Sea or whether it's in the international economic system. But on the other hand, that we're not trying to create a world which is so disadvantageous to China that it's forced to be revisionist. And that brings us back to our favorite topic, which is the Taiwan Straits, which is just unavoidable here. Because we're still having the debate that we've had for so many years about the nature of our commitment to Taiwan. And, and I have to say that, like、uh, Churchill's observation about democracy, the, the current state of our policy is the worst of all possible, except for all the other alternatives. And, and we have prospered, everyone in the region has prospered. Prospered by the situation in which we have a resolute commitment to the status quo and no alteration of the status quo by peaceful means. And we see too many voices in, in the United States and elsewhere suggesting that because of China's more belligerent policies, that we change that. But as I say, despite all the difficulties and the, the ambiguity associated with elements of our current policy, the alternative is so provocative and so dangerous that we have to be very careful because at the end of the day, And I think I, 
I, if you read the very thoughtful speech that uh, President Tsai just gave on Taiwan's National Day here, I think the, the people in Taiwan, the leadership in Taiwan, understand the importance of a reasonable maintenance of the status quo as an element of stability, as uh, Matsuda Sensei uh, has said. And it's hard, and it's, it's, it requires hard work and efforts on all sides to make clear to everybody the fact that we benefit more from the status quo than from any revision that anyone could imagine with respect to Taiwan, and that that ought to be keep our mind focused as we move forward to increasingly dangerous times given the political dynamics in the PRC, in Taiwan, in the United States, and elsewhere in the region. This is, this is an arrangement in specifically with respect to Taiwan, and more broadly, an arrangement that has sustained stability in the Asia Pacific for an extraordinarily long time, since the end of the Korean War. There have been a few uh, slight deviations from that uh, since that time. But for the most part, the economic miracle that has made this the powerhouse of the world has come from a commitment of all sides to recognize that serious dis revisionist disruptions serve no one's interest. And we need to bring that home, and all of the parties need to embrace that fundamental insight. Thank you very much. One thing. Listening to your conversation, one thing that came home to me, this is not directly related to Russia-Ukraine war, but uh, in this region, in the Pacific, in order to for the U.S. to engage in this uh, uh, area, IPEF was proposed by the U.S. And uh, uh, so IPEF came into being now. Now, perhaps for domestic audience of the United States, the international order uh, based on the in economic cooperation, what kind of benefits would that bring to American audience? I think that was a question for us, the centering around the economy, we would like to build a very close cooperation that can be a resilience vis-a-vis -vis China, and as Professor Matsuda said, double-track approach would be enabled by this. That was what I thought. Now, since we have only less than one minute, and we have received several questions from the floor and participants, but unfortunately, I have to cut that panel discussion at this point in time, and there is no need for me to summarize the session. But uh, when it comes to Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, war, uh, that has an implication regarding Indo-Pacific and the risks and crisis. And uh, it is not only conceptual or theoretical issue. We have to consider this issue in uh, real terms, in actual terms. So this war uh, triggered such a way of thinking. We have to appropriately assess risks involved, and we have to uh, consider opportunities in five to ten years to come, and we have to grasp good opportunities. And based on that, we have to brace for uh, China's uh, threat. And in order to avoid a war or worst case scenario, and the Japan and US have to cooperate to build a very effective strategy in this regard. I apologize for my uh, poor chairmanship. But at this point in time, I would like to conclude session one. Thank you very much. A very wonderful uh, reports and uh, uh, panel uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the panel and also moderator. Once again, please give them a big round of applause.